Thank you. The next item of business is First Minister's questions, and at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by wishing Scotland's men's team the very best of luck as they open the Euro 2024 tournament tomorrow night against Germany. The Tartan Army have travelled in huge numbers to support Steve Clark and the team, and I know we will all be cheering them on to success. Presiding officer, this week during the election debate in Glasgow, Anna McClintock asked John Swinney what he would do to improve Scotland's health service. She spoke about her 93-year-old mother, who needed urgent care, but waited six hours for an ambulance to arrive, and then another two hours outside the hospital before she was admitted. John Swinney didn't have answers for Anna on Tuesday. So what does he say to her now? and so many other people across Scotland who have found themselves in the same situation. First Minister. Sir, sir, before I address the substantive question that Douglas Ross has put to me, can I also uh, record my good wishes to the Scotland's men's team who will play the host Germany in the opening match of Euro 2024. Um, if I can say this to Parliament, it's great to see Scotland back in Europe, where we rightly belong. <laughs> As First Minister, I want to wish Steve Clark's team the best of luck and wish the huge numbers of Scotland supporters making the journey a safe and mem memorable trip. I know the Tartan Army will be an absolute credit to Scotland and I know the team will be a credit to Scotland because they have inspired so many of us by their success in getting to Euro 2024. And I look forward very much to being present to encourage the Scotland team on Friday evening and to ensure their success on Friday night. Um, President Officer, Mr Ross raised a, a significant issue to me, and as I uh, indicated in the debate, the television debate uh, the other evening, that I apologise to Anna McClintock for the experience that her mother had had. Uh, one of the challenges that we are facing is about the volume of demand for health service uh, utilisation in Scotland. Uh, that is also challenging because of the level of delayed discharges that we have in hospitals, which means that our hospitals are operating at very high levels of occupancy. So what we are doing about that is that we are trying to work with local authorities to tackle the issue of delayed discharge. And we've had extensive discussions, I personally, with the leadership of the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities and the Health Secretary has followed that up to work to reduce delayed discharges and to reduce congestion within our hospitals. And then in addition to that, we're obviously investing in our health service to an extent that we now have record levels of staffing to ensure that we can meet the needs and the demands of the population within Scotland. But I acknowledge that not everybody is getting the, 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 the treatment that they require as quickly as they, uh, as they require it, but there is a very focused effort being undertaken within the government, within our health boards, to make sure that can be delivered in all localities in Scotland. Douglas Ross. The First Minister has apologised again to Anna McClintock, but there are many more people like Anna concern for the, the safety and the well-being of their parents and their grandparents. Anna asks the question, is our NHS broken? That's the point she put to the First Minister and other party leaders, and that's the concern of people up and down Scotland. People who can't get a GP or a dentist appointment. People waiting too long for ambulances or to get into A&E departments. People who need urgent care, but they can't get it when they need it. All they seem to get from John Swinney and the SNP are excuses. Don't they deserve to hear the solutions? First Minister. I, th I think the, well, I, I, I have set out the solutions in my earlier answer to Mr Ross, and I, the government is very focused on ensuring the NHS meets the needs of individuals. We all want the NHS to be able to deliver what people require when they require it. And the government has taken the hard decisions to increase the resources that are available to the National Health Service. Now, if we had, for example, just passed on the consequentials to the health service that had been allocated as a, as a consequence of UK funding formulas, uh, we would have passed on a lower amount of money than we have actually invested in the National Health Service. So we've taken, as a government, hard decisions about increasing tax on higher earners so we can allocate more resources to the National Health Service. 
Now, I accept that even having undertaken that allocation of increased resources, there remain significant strains in the National Health Service. So the point I was making on Tuesday evening in the discussion in which Mr Ross and I and others were involved is that what we cannot have as an outcome to this election is a continuation of the austerity of the Conservative government yeah. because that would be disastrous for the National Health Service. Yeah. Dr Ross. The National Health Service here in Scotland has been under the remit of the SNP and John Swinney for 17 years. Another audience member said to Mr Swinney on Tuesday, don't blame elsewhere, take responsibility. And again, we're getting the same from John Swinney. No responsibility for Scotland's NHS. He said it needs to meet the needs of individuals, but it's not. It's so clear to all of us, it is not meeting the needs of individuals. And elderly people are routinely left far longer than they should be for care in our National Health Service. We've got a freedom of information response which shows just how stark the situation is. Patients aged over 100 are some of the most vulnerable in our communities. And in just over a year, hundreds of them have been made to wait beyond the target treatment time in A&E departments. In over 100 cases, people aged over 100 have been waiting more than 12 hours for emergency treatment. These are people over 100 waiting more than half a day to get emergency treatment here in Scotland's NHS. And that's only people aged over 100. Many more elderly people are waiting in agony too. John Swinney must surely agree that is appalling and unacceptable. So what is he going to do to fix it? First Minister. I, I, as I always indicate to Parliament when I'm responding to questions, I take responsibility for the actions of my government and the public services on my behalf. Uh, I, uh, that, that is my duty as First Minister and I do so on all occasions. And the situation that Mr Ross has just recounted, I suspect, is uh, addressed by the fact that our hospitals are operating at such a level of congestion that individuals are not able to be transferred from accident and emergency into uh, wider hospital care because our, hosp because our hosp well, for the simple reason that the hospitals are so congested because of delayed discharge. And that's the, that's the explanation of the problem. And the solution to it is what I said in my first answer, which is to work with our local authorities to expand the provision of social care in the community to ensure that we can address the delayed discharge issue. But ultimately, this comes back to the resources that are available to the National Health Service. And I have set out that this government has taken responsibility for this because we have been prepared to take the hard decision on taxation to increase tax and to ensure that we have more resources been allocated to the National Health Service. Now, Mr Ross would be in a stronger position to argue for this if he hadn't argued for me to follow the budget of Liz Truss. Yeah. That was, what, that was what Douglas Ross wanted me to do. He wanted me to follow Members. the tax... He wanted me to follow the tax-cutting agenda of Liz Truss. If I'd done that, that would have been catastrophic for the country, catastrophic for the National Health Service, and I'm really glad I didn't do it. Yeah. Douglas Ross. I just quite like John Swinney to focus on Scotland's NHS, our elderly patients that are waiting far too long to get the treatment they deserve. And, and he mentions delayed discharge. I mean, the Cabinet Secretary to his left promised to eradicate it seven years ago. Seven years ago, the SNP were going to get rid of delayed discharge altogether, and it is still having a huge impact on our NHS now. Now, our FOI only shows the problems within a &E departments and ambulance waiting times. But as we've raised with the SNP many times, there is a crisis at every single level within Scotland's NHS. The number of GP appointments has fallen by 146,000 in the last three years. Over the last 10 years, the number of GP practices has reduced in every single health board across the country. In rural areas, they're shutting at twice the rate of urban areas. People across Scotland don't have access to the health care they need and deserve, and that has to change. We already know what will be line one of the SNP's manifesto. So just how far down John Swinney's list of priorities will Scotland's NHS be? 
First Minister. Well, the NHS is at the top of my list of priorities, and it's why. And it's, Let's hear it's, the First Minister. And, it, and it's why Scotland has got an accident and emergency system which is the best performing in the United Kingdom, and it has been for the last nine years. Yeah. So that's why. That's Let why, us hear the First Minister. That is why the National Health Service is at the top of my list of priorities. And in relation to general practitioners, uh, we have more GPs per head of population in Scotland than any other part of the United Kingdom, able to provide the care to people in Scotland in various parts uh, of our, our country. What I'd say to Douglas Ross about priorities is that you can tell how governments act by the resources that they allocate. Yeah. And this government has taken the tough decision to increase tax on higher earners so we could, increase it to, we could invest more in the National Health Service yeah. than was proposed by the Conservative government yeah. in the consequentials. Yeah. So what that tells us is the Scottish government is giving the necessary priority to the National Health Service. And the last thing I would say, presiding officer, is this. And Mr Ross asked me about the question of independence, and I will answer his question very directly. Scotland would be in a stronger position to take greater decisions about investment in the National Health Service if we had the full powers of independence to use the resources of our country to create the best future for our country. And I'm proud to represent that position. Yeah. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. Can I join others in wishing Manager Steve Clark, Captain Andy Robertson, Vice Captain John McGinn, and the entire men's Scotland team all the very best for the Euros and also uh, wish the Tartan Army a safe and enjoyable visit to Germany? Uh, President Officer, before I was elected, I worked in our NHS as a dentist, just one part of our NHS which is currently in crisis. And earlier this week, I visited a practice in Fife, and much to their frustration, they can't take any more NHS patients. In fact, four out of five practices across the country aren't accepting new NHS patients, and more and more people are being forced to go and pay private. And it's not just dentistry, it's all across our health service, and the problem is growing. The number of people being forced to pay for their own care has gone up 86% since 2019 and are at the highest levels ever. Labour created our NHS to be free at the point of need. Why does that principle not apply under the SNP? First Minister. So, sir, I, again, I recognise the challenges that exist within dental practice, but I would point out that Scotland has 57 dentists per 100,000 of the population, compared with 42 in England and 46 in Wales. So the investment that the government has made in the National Health Service, and particularly in dentistry, is an important contribution to establishing that position yeah. and to achieving that position. And it wouldn't have happened had the government not given that priority since we came to office in 2007. Now, the government has, of course, undertaken a significant intervention through the introduction of a root and branch re reform of the NHS dental payment system in November of last year. And obviously we're in the early days of the implementation of that reform package. So by combination of the investment in the workforce and the investment in that reform package, the government is supporting dentistry within Scotland to achieve the necessary set delivery of service to people around the country. Anna Sarwar. I, I note the uh, First Minister didn't uh, respond to the fact that 86% increase in people having to go for self-payment because of a lack of access to our NHS. But also the stats that John Swinney quoted will be zero comfort to people who can't access NHS dentistry are being forced to go private. And I think he needs to get his head out of the sand. Uh, Labour founded our NHS free at the point of need, open to everyone, regardless of the ability to pay. But under the SNP, people again and again are forced to pay because they can't get treatment in time. Last year, more than 1,500 people were forced to pay for knee replacements at a cost of nearly £16,000 each. 8,000 private operations for cataract, more than £2,800 each. And almost 3,000 hip replacements in Scotland at a cost of more than £14,000 each. So, First Minister, in the middle of a cost-of-living crisis, when mortgages, 
energy bills and food prices have all gone up, how much have people had to dig into their own savings or borrow from friends and family in order to pay for their own treatment? First Minister. Well, obviously, I, 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 I regret the fact that people have felt the need to take recourse to private treatment. And I've made clear in my answers over several weeks that the demand on the National Health Service, particularly as a consequence of the increase in caseload because of the cancellation of, of procedures during the COVID pandemic, has increased the presentation of demand on the National Health Service. And we are working to reduce those waiting times and those waiting lists to ensure that people get treat treatment at an earlier time than is the case just now. But I do have to say to Anna Sawar, I think he's on very, very thin ground in challenging me, on, challenging me on the question of private involvement in the National Health Service. Let me just remind him of the comments of Labour's Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Streeting, who said that a UK Labour government would, and I quote, hold the door wide open for the private sector in the National Health Service. He said also, we will go further than New Labour ever did. I want the NHS to form partnerships with the private sector that goes beyond just hospitals. Now, what we have here is a classic example of what Anna Sawar gets up to in public debate. Yeah. He comes here in Scotland and says one thing, yeah. and in England his bosses are doing a completely yeah. different thing, yeah. which will have an effect on our budget here in yeah. Scotland. Yeah. And Anna Sawar has already been caught out on this this week. Yeah. It's not good enough to say one thing in Scotland and be contradicted by your bosses in London. Yeah. Anna Sawar. Thank you. That is a frankly embarrassing response to the fact that 3,000 3, people in Scotland have had hear to Mr. pay £14,000 for a hip replacement. And let me quote, Mr Swinney wants to do quotes, let me quote two simple sentences from the UK Labour Manifesto published today. Direct response. We saved the NHS before. And the next Labour government will do so again. With Labour, it will always be publicly owned and publicly funded. Not more people going private under the SNP. And let me also quote another sentence. There will be no return to austerity. So stop the scaremongering, stop the misinformation and be truthful with the people across Scotland. Members. But I asked, but I asked John Swinney how much people have had to find from their savings or borrow from friends in order to pay for, NHS, for, pay for private treatment. And John Swinney very deliberately failed to answer the question. Yeah. So let me tell him, just for hip, knee and cataract surgeries in Scotland last year, people had to pay more than £83 million. £83 million. That's what families had to find in the middle of a cost of living crisis because of SNP incompetence. And the SNP's mismanagement of our NHS is so bad that it's those who are in pain, who are sick and who are injured who are being forced to literally pay the price. But, presiding officer, perhaps most horrifyingly of all, there are people who are being forced to go private and pay for their cancer treatment in Scotland. So for all the heckles at the back, this is the reality under this SNP government. Cancer, Scotland's biggest killer, I must have is a something question, that Mr. touches Sarwar. us all. Every second wasted in the fight against cancer decreases the chances of survival. Heckling cancer patients having to pay private. Is Mr. that the height Sarwar, of the SNP Mr. ambition? Mr Sarwar, I'd be Last grateful year, if you could please put a question to the First Minister. I'm coming right now to the question, Presiding Officer. Last year, more than one thousand rounds of chemo. I will, I will allow my, this one is my further question. opportunity. This is my question, President. I Officer. certainly hope it is, Mr. Sarwar. Last year, more than one thousand rounds of chemotherapy were paid for privately. Do, why does the First Minister believe people in Scotland should have to pay for their life-saving cancer treatment, one thousand rounds, because of his party's failure and incompetence? First Minister. I don't want anybody to have to pay for cancer treatment in Scotland, and, but, but I have to face up to the reality of the challenges facing our National Health Service. Let me just give Mr Sarwar a statistic. 
The rate of people self-funding for private health care in, in, in England is 66% higher than it is in Scotland. And in Labour-run Wales, Labour, oh, Jackie Bailey says, but it's the Tories. Well, we'll give Labour-run Wales as a comparison. It's 13% higher in Labour-run Wales than it is in SNP-run Scotland. So perhaps it's not a good idea to heckle me when I'm in mid-flow, Jackie Bailey. Now, you see, what, what this all comes down to is the financial envelope that's available for the National Health Service. And this government has taken the hard decisions to increase tax, yeah. to, incre to in in improve the amount of money Again. that's invested in the National Health yeah. Service. Now, there was a day, there was a day where the Labour Party supported us on that, yeah. but now they've deserted the pitch. Yeah. They've run away on orders from London. The Labour Party in Scotland is now voting against higher taxes on higher earners in Scotland because they've been told by their bosses in London to do exactly that. Yeah. That will undermine the investment in our National Health Service and that is why Anna Sarwar has not a scrap of credibility to tell me that there will be no return to austerity under a Labour government. A Labour government has got to make £20 billion worth of spending cuts to pick up where the Tories have left off. It will be continued austerity from Labour and Scotland should vote against it. Yeah. Thank you. Before I move to the next question, I just point out that the length of time that we've taken to reach this point of this item of business is disadvantaging backbenchers who wish to put questions to the First Minister. And I'd be grateful if members could reflect on that. At question number three, I call Lorna Slater. As clean energy expands and fossil fuel demand declines, there is no need for investment in new coal, oil and natural gas. That's a quote, not from the Scottish Green Party manifesto, but from the International Energy Agency. This week, the Scottish Government continues to equivocate on new licences for oil and gas. The First Minister's latest position is that the SNP are OK with new oil and gas if it passes a climate compatibility assessment. Can I ask the First Minister how he thinks any climate compatibility assessment will say it's OK to drill for new oil when global experts in the industry, in energy industry say that it is not? Minister. So, so it, it has been the position of the Scottish Government for a formidable amount of time, and certainly not something new this week, that there had to be climate compatibility assessments undertaken on any particular um, new oil and gas licence applications. And that's been the position of the Scottish Government for some considerable time. Um, the, the Government's position is that we've got to assess our energy security needs, we've got to reduce our emissions in line with our climate commissions, uh, commitments, and we've got to deliver affordable energy supplies. So the commitment I give to Lorna Slater willingly today is that the Government recognises the absolute necessity of the journey to net zero, uh, but we also, and, and that is why there has to be a climate compatibility assessment on any consideration of any oil and gas licence, and why I will have no truck with the commitment of the Prime Minister to commit to 100 new oil and gas licences without a question being asked. Lorna Slater. Our position on the energy transition needs to be evidence-based. That evidence doesn't change on a case-by-case -case basis. The Scottish Government's position is like a 40-a-day smoker being told by the doctor, stop smoking, you're killing yourself, and the smoker replying, I'll treat each cigarette on a case-by-case -case basis. This position is not only threatening our environment, it's putting off investment in the green jobs of the future, which our communities so desperately need. When will the SNP get off the fence, get behind the science on this, and admit that Scotland's future relies on green energy and on Scotland's oil staying in the ground? First Minister. I'm, 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 I'm not sure, it might just be me, but I'm not sure the analogy worked particularly well that was conveyed in the question there. I think, I think people would expect their government 
to act in an evidence-based fashion. Yeah. And that's exactly what we will do. And we will look at any individual application with the evidence, uh, although I, I do point out for the factual accuracy, we do not take those decisions. Those decisions are taken by the United Kingdom government. But we would argue for that. That's why I say a reckless commitment to 100 new oil and gas licences uh, is, is just the territory of climate denier status. And, and I will go nowhere near that. On the question of investment in green jobs, uh, there is a really good volume of investment in green jobs being undertaken. The Net Zero Secretary was in yeah. NIG just a few weeks ago uh, at the inauguration of the Sumitomo investment, which has been a fabulous investment in the renewable sector. I was myself in Ardazir, which is a, a big investment involving the Scottish National Investment Bank and um, Haventus which is a significant investment in green jobs. So I want to signal very clear, and, and of course, over the, the, the course of the SNP government's time in office, we have substantially decarbonised electricity generation in Scotland, whereby our net electricity generation has gone from 26%, uh, if my memory says me right, the numbers in Scotland, to 113% uh, in, in the most recent data. All of that demonstrates our commitment to renewable energy, and that will be absolutely central to the government's energy strategy when it's published. Question number four, Jackie Dunbar. To ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of any implications for its policy for economic development in Scotland of the findings of the Resolution Foundation's recent report on the UK's economic and trade performance. First Minister. So the report by the Resolution Foundation highlights that the UK has faced a decade of economic stagnation and low productivity growth. It also, sh also shows that the UK's trade openness has declined by 0.7 percentage points since 2019, compared with a 1.2 percent percentage point rise for G7 countries excluding the United Kingdom. A hard Brexit that Scotland voted to reject has damaged our economy. Scotland is open for business, trade and investment. But actions by the UK government, such as taking us out of the European Union and their damaging approach to migration, are holding back our economy. Only independence will give Scotland the full range of powers to take the economic decisions based on our own needs, with the full fiscal and tax levers of a normal independent country. Jackie Dunbar. The report indicates that the principal driver of economic growth in the UK since 2010 has been immigration. Can the First Minister outline how the conclusions of this report feed into the work of the Scottish Government's Building a New Scotland series, where the migration paper outlines Scotland's unique migration needs designed to meet our demographic challenges? First Minister. Uh, President Officer, the issue of migration is central to the economic well-being of any society and I have to say we, the United Kingdom is putting itself at a formidable competitive disadvantage yeah. by taking such a hostile attitude towards migration and we can see that now beginning to have an effect on the position of some of our universities who have been absolutely wonderful examples of international institutions that are now finding their opportunities constrained by the approach to migration, which is damaging to the interests of Scotland. So I want to signal the Scottish Government's willingness to engage constructively on finding routes to support migration, which will help to boost our economy. I would also note, Presiding Officer, the information published this week by the Royal Bank of Scotland Purchasing Managers Index, which showed that private sector business activity growth in Scotland, notwithstanding these challenges, was second highest across the United Kingdom's 12 nations and regions, which demonstrates that Scotland is very much open for business. Yeah, yeah. Question number five, Sue Webber. Uh, to ask the First Minister what progress the Scottish Government has made in reducing drug-related harm in light of the latest quarterly statistics showing a 17% increase in suspected drug deaths. First Minister. Officer, I was disappointed to read the statistics that came out this week, and the loss of life from drugs in Scotland is truly devastating. I express my heartfelt condolences to anyone who has lost a loved one through addiction. The Government is working to tackle the drugs crisis by delivering the £250 million national mission to reduce drug deaths and improve the lives of those impacted by drugs. That national mission has led to investment in a range of measures to prevent deaths and reduce harms, including implementation of MAT standards, widening the lock zone access, increasing re residential rehabilitation capacity and improving surveillance. The emergence of new substances raises further concerns, but for those affected by problem substance use, 
or those working in the field who are supporting people every day. I want to reinforce our commitment to continue to do all that we can to reduce this tragic loss of life. Sue Weber. First Minister, the data published last week reveals that around 25 people a week are dying from drug use. The new stats published this week show that suspected drug deaths are up 10 per cent in the 12 months to March 2024 compared to last year. They are not reducing. This is something the Scottish Recovery Consortium has called a move in the wrong direction. Can the First Minister explain why successive SNP leaders have failed to tackle the drug death crisis in Scotland, instead following the same failed approach? And will finally accept the need to change tact and give his full backing to our Right to Recovery Bill? First Minister. I, I acknowledge the seriousness and the significance of this issue. And on the question of the Right to Recovery Bill, I've indicated that I'll happily meet Mr Ross to discuss that issue. And I, I will do so. And, and I'm very open to any elements of the consideration of that bill that will help us in the efforts that we take forward to be taken seriously um, as part of the process. I would say to Sue Webber that the government has tried, and under my leadership will continue to try, to be as open as it possibly can be to constructing the measures that will be effective in, 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 in delivering better outcomes than we are currently delivering. In question time a couple of weeks ago, I responded to Ms Webber's colleague, Russell Finlay, by indicating that there are, greater threat, there are additional threats that are coming our way because of the strength of some of the synthetic opioids that are now entering into the uh, drugs market in Scotland. That has to be tackled, and we are trying to tackle that. But I signal the willingness of the government to engage constructively across Parliament to find the ways and the interventions that will allow us to, uh, to reduce drugs deaths, because I acknowledge the severity and the seriousness of the harm that is caused to families and to individuals. And I remain open to a wide cross-party discussion on that question. Question number six, Pauline McNeill. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports of hundreds of rapes and sexual assaults that have been reported by sex workers were not acted upon. First Minister. President officer, I was deeply troubled by these reports. Any violence against women, whenever that has occurred, is abhorrent. It would not be appropriate for me to comment on criminal investigations and prosecutions, but I do note that Police Scotland launched an operation in 2018 to examine historic sex offences. <laughs> I want all victims to have the confidence to report sexual crimes no matter when they happened. Therefore, I am pleased that Police Scotland has encouraged anyone who has not previously reported such assaults to come forward and to do so. Pauline McNeill. Uh, Scottish Labour would endorse the First Minister's comments on the need to tackle violence against women and girls. But during the Emma Caldwell murder investigation, nearly 300 rapes and sexual assaults reported by sex, work sex workers, including Emma's killers, were not dealt with by police at the time. And a former detective said that he received multiple reports of rape when he worked on the murder inquiry, including Emma's killer, but they were boxed and marked as irrelevant and not followed up. So does the First Minister agree with me this was a shameful period in time when attitudes meant that sex workers who reported rape were not taken seriously and that these women were vulnerable and should have had their chance to be heard before a jury. And furthermore, if there had been an investigation at the time, perhaps Emma's murder might have been caught sooner. First Minister. President Officer, Pauline McNeill is a, a very experienced, long-serving uh, advocate in the whole area of criminal justice, so she will understand, uh, who, and, and she knows how much I respect her contribution to Parliament on this matter, she'll understand it's difficult for me to comment on some of the issues that she has raised. So having put that caveat into my answer, can I say that I absolutely accept that there is a necessity to take any reporting of crimes of a sexual nature deadly seriously, and that is my expectation that that is the case at all times. If I could quote the words of Deputy Chief Constable Beck Smith in relation to this matter. The Deputy Chief Constable said, time is no barrier to justice, and if women feel like they want to come forward and report now, then it's absolutely the time to do that. And I would encourage individuals to follow the Deputy Chief Constable's invitation and to do that. And let me just say, 
in general, with the caveat that I've put on the record already, I think it is essential that any woman who feels they have been the victim of a sexual assault at any stage should come forward. And my expectation of Police Scotland and of the Crown is that that would be taken seriously. Thank you. We move to constituency and general supplementaries, and I call Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On Monday evening, a female passenger on the MVL Isle of Arran fell overboard as the vessel approached her drossen. Using the vessel's rescue craft, the crew acted with incredible speed to rescue this woman from the sea and help her recover on board. The crew's training and speed of action was the difference between life and death. Will the First Minister join me in paying tribute to the Isle of Arran's crew for their heroic efforts in saving a life? First Minister. <laughs> I would like to record my personal thanks to the master and the crew of the MV Isle of Arran for the, the speed and the intensity of the response. Uh, the training, the level of professionalism that was deployed by the crew is to be commended. But of course, this is training and professionalism that is built up by the, um, the commitment of members of staff of the CalMAT network to ensure that they run and operate a safe network. And, I think this should be an example to give great public confidence about the strength and the capability of the CalMAC personnel. So as well as providing a lifeline service to communities across the West Coast, CalMAC are a key part of the maritime framework in these areas and are regularly tasked to support maritime incidents given their presence in the area. On behalf of the Scottish Government, I express my warmest thanks to the staff that have been involved in this important exercise. Finlay Carson. Thank you, President Officer. For over nine months, there has been no rail services in my constituency of Galloway and Western Fries, with all rail services between Stranraer and Ayr stopped following the arson attack on the Ayr Station Hotel. Given the considerable disruption to my constituents and visitors over this lengthy time period, and as an incentive to get people back onto the trains, will the First Minister explore every opportunity to work with me and constituents in ScotRail to provide special offers or reduced fares to encourage people back onto the trains when the, re the service restarts in July? First Minister. But I think the, the, the good news is that we're able to get services running back down to Stranraer in July, and I'm grateful to the Transport Secretary and uh, Scott Rail and Transport Scotland and Network Rail for the work that's been undertaken and South Ayrshire Council, because this has been a very difficult problem. And Mr Carson uh, knows the ins and outs of the public safety issues involved in the fire at the station. So we just, we simply cannot, we've just, I've just answered a question from Mr Gibson on safety on the transport network. So we all know the realities here. I will give consideration to Mr Carson's uh, point. Uh, these things always cost money, of course, so we've got to try to find that. But if Mr Carson would care to write to me with any suggestions he thinks would be helpful, I'd be happy to consider them along with the Transport Secretary. Pam Duncan Clancy. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister has spent quite some time claiming that he's anti-cuts, but the reality is he is the architect of austerity. Just ask teachers in Glasgow who have voted this week to strike as a result of his government's cuts in their latest attempt to save the jobs and protect education. Presiding officer, teachers have spoken, parents and pupils have protested and Parliament has voted. So can I ask the First Minister, will he now finally listen, step in and save these jobs? First Minister. Uh, I, I I understand the significance of the issues that have been raised by Pam Duncan Glancy, um, and I've made clear uh, in previous answers that had the budget proposals of the Labour Party been accepted by Glasgow City Council, the reductions in the teaching workforce uh, could have been greater than those that are proposed by the existing City Council administration. But this is where we get to the hard realities of the public finances. Pam Duncan Glancy voted in the budget earlier this year against the tax increases that we had put in place. Yeah. That would have reduced the amount of money available for public services. So how is it remotely credible for the Labour Party to come here and ask me to spend more money on local authority services and education services when they want to deliver austerity in the Scottish Parliament as well as austerity in the United Kingdom Parliament. It is just 
it's a hard reality that Mr Sarwar, who's now shouting and muttering at me all the time during my answers, it's a hard reality that's about to confront Mr Sarwar. He can't have it both ways. Yeah. He can't come here and demand that we do more when a Westminster Labour government is going to propose to cut our budget because of austerity. Yeah. Bob Doris. Thank you, President Officer. Several constituents have contacted me over eye-watering increases to their SP's loan card costs of up to 135 per cent. Some Mid Hill commuters are now paying the same as someone travelling from much further afield, such as East Kilbride, for example. I have written to SPT asking to meet them and urging them to pause the increases scheduled for June the 24th. Does the First Minister share my concerns over the wholly unacceptable increases for my constituents during a cost of living crisis and other implications, potential implications for the Scottish Government's fair fares review and its ambitions to have capped fares and integrated ticketing. First Minister. President Officer, I am aware of the issue that uh, Mr Doris raises and the Transport Secretary has written to SBT uh, about this issue. <laughs> the zone card is a commercial ticket managed by bus rail and subway operators and neither the Scottish Government nor Transport Scotland were part of the fares discussions by the companies involved. We do want to make it easier for more and more affordable for people to choose travel by public transport, which will support economic growth, tackle inequality and address climate change. The Fares Fair Review presents, uh, presents a package of measures to make public transport more accessible, available and affordable, with the cost of transport more fairly shared across government, business and society. And I hope that some of the thinking within the Fair, Fair Review can lead to a different outcome being taken on what is a very significant issue for Mr Doris's constituents and others in the west of Scotland. Amy Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I too commend the actions of the crew of the Isle of Arran for the aforementioned incident? But I hope the First Minister will also acknowledge the many ongoing disruptions that are taking place in the West Coast Ferry Network. Yesterday, no fewer than four vessels were out of action for technical reasons, and that's on top of long-standing issues on the Arran route, with the Caledon Caledonian Isles vessel uh, is undergoing a series of, of repairs and is due to be out of action for most of the summer. Uh, I hope the First Minister will understand the disruption this is having on our island, island communities. I have very grave concerns that we are simply staring down the barrel of a summer of chaos on our ferry network. Can I ask uh, the First Minister what his government is doing about this chaos? And is he as disappointed as I am and my constituents are that not one of his backbench MSPs signed my motion to allow a members debate on this very subject next week? First Minister. Uh, the the obviously... Uh, instances and examples where there are uh, problems on the ferry network and we obviously have a, a, an ageing fleet and the government is investing significantly in new vessels. There will be six new vessels, substantial new vessels in the ferry fleet by 2026 um, and uh, the, the first of those um, will be uh, coming into the network later on this year. And as Mr Green will be aware, the second of the Isla vessels was launched successfully um, uh, from the Yard in Turkey uh, just at the weekend. Obviously, on a short-term basis, the chartering of the MV Alfred uh, has helped on the, the Arran routes, uh, while the, the MV Caledon Isles has been in dry dock for extensive repairs. Uh, and we obviously had supplemented the network with the purchase of the MV Loch Frisa. Um, I do understand the disruption that is experienced by island communities. As Mr Green knows, I'm a frequent user of the uh, CalMAC network and will do so in the course of the next few weeks again. Um, we, we are working with the network, but I think it's also important to recognise that there are many, many, many occasions in which the network performs superbly well, not just in relation to the safety issue that Mr Gibson has raised, but also in the delivery of essential lifeline services to our communities. And I thank CalMAC and their staff for the efforts that they put in to do so. Martin Whitfield. Very grateful, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the First Minister what were his responses to the GMB Union's call for the Scottish Government to end its opposition to nuclear energy after the Union's warn of a risk of this nation returning to the days of power cuts and candles, with hundreds of skilled Scots already leaving to go and work abroad because of this decline? First Minister. Um, I, I, I obviously, you know, I, I, I respect the fact that people have a different opinion to me. I don't, I'm not a fan of the nuclear industry. I don't, uh, I don't support the investment in 
nuclear power plants. Uh, I never have, I never will. Uh, I think the country should focus on creating uh, clean, green, renewable energy yeah. resources. We've got a formidable track record of investment in Scotland and a formidable record of transformation within the generation of electricity within our country. What would help us is if we had reform of the electricity market in the United yeah. Kingdom, yeah. which would perhaps result in a situation where people who were generating the electricity were not, or the areas that were generating the electricity were not having to pay exorbitant energy costs, which is the current proceeds yeah. of the UK energy market. And that might be something that Mr Whitfield could take up with his colleagues should they be in the position to influence these issues on the 5th of July and later. And Fergus Ewing. President officer, it's uh, with great sadness that I must report that uh, another person has lost her life on the A9. And our hearts go out to her family and the others who were also injured in this incident. The First Minister kindly agreed uh, some weeks ago when his first First Minister's questions to meet with myself and fellow MSPs across this chamber from Conservative, Labour, Liberal and ALBA parties in order for us all cross-party to put the case for acceleration of the announced programme for completion of the duelling of the A9, which of course will have the consequence of fewer more lives being lost. I appreciate during part of the First Minister is limited in what he can say, but can I ask him, if you, uh, can I ask him this? Will he give this request the most serious, thorough and sympathetic consideration? First Minister. President Officer, first of all, may I express and echo um, the comments of my colleague Fergus Ewing about the, uh, in relation to the lady who died on the A9 last night near Carbridge. Uh, I'm very sorry to hear that news and I express my sympathies to her family and to everyone who's been affected by this incident. Um, as Mr Ewing will know, uh, the Government has an ongoing programme of investment in the A9 duelling, which was set out by the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero some months ago. Um, the Transport Secretary now expects to authorise the uh, procurement at uh, Moy to Tamatin in July, um, is our expectation of the completion of the procurement process there. And just the other week there, the procurement process on Tay Crossing to Ballinluig, which is a substantial stretch of the road, uh, has been commenced. And we have done that deliberately to ensure that there is continuity in the uh, delivery of the contract. Um, Mr Ewing knows me well enough to know that I will give thorough, serious and thoughtful consideration to all of the proposals that are put to me and I look forward to meeting with the cross-party grouping, which I understand is scheduled for next week, to enable us to, uh, do, to, for me to hear first-hand from colleagues across the Chamber about the importance of this issue and how we might act together to try to accelerate the proposals that are before us. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Fulton McGregor. And there will now be a short suspension to allow those leaving the chamber and gallery to do so before that item begins. <laughs>